Section 22 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Story Girl. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. Part One, The Story of Merlin. Here followeth a particular account of the enchantment of Merlin by a certain damsel, hight Vivian, and of all the circumstances thereunto appertaining. Likewise it is to be narrated how King Arthur was betrayed by his own sister, and of how he would certainly have been slain only for the help of that same enchantress, Vivian, who was the cause of Merlin's undoing. Also it shall be told how the sheath of Excalibur was lost at that time. Chapter First How Queen Morgana le Fay meditated evil against King Arthur, and how she sent a damsel to beguile the enchanter, Merlin. Now Morgana le Fay was a very cunning enchantress, and was so much mistress of magic that she could, by means of potent spells, work her will upon all things, whether quick or dead. For Merlin himself had been her master in times past, and had taught her his arts whilst she was still a young damsel at the court of Uther Pendragon. So it was that next to Merlin, she was, at that time, the most potent enchanter in all the world. Nevertheless, she lacked Merlin's foreknowledge of things to happen, and his gift of prophecy thereupon, for these things he could not impart unto any one, wherefore she had not learned them of him. Now after Queen Morgana le Fay had come to the island of Avalon, as aforetold, she brooded a great deal over that affront which she deemed King Arthur had placed upon her house, and the more she brooded upon it, the more big did it become in her mind. Wherefore, at last, it seemed to her that she could have no pleasure in life unless she could punish King Arthur for that which he had done. Yea, she would have been glad to see him dead at her feet because of the anger that she felt against him. But Queen Morgana was very well aware that she could never do the king, her brother, an injury so long as Merlin was there to safeguard him. For Merlin would certainly foresee any danger that might threaten the king, and would counteract it, wherefore she was aware that if she would destroy the king, she must first destroy Merlin. Now there was at the court of Queen Morgana le Fay a certain damsel of such marvelous and bewitching beauty that her like was hardly to be seen in all of the world. This damsel was fifteen years old and of royal blood, being the daughter of the King of Northumberland, and her name was Vivian. This damsel, Vivian, was both wise and cunning beyond all measure for one so young. Moreover, she was without any heart, being cold and cruel to all who were contrary-minded to her wishes. So because she was so cunning and wise, Queen Morgana liked her and taught her many things of magic and sorcery which she knew. But notwithstanding all that Queen Morgana did for her, this maiden did not feel any love for her mistress, being altogether devoid of heart. One day this damsel and Queen Morgana le Fay sat together in a garden of that magic island of Avalon, and the garden was upon a very high terrace and overlooked the sea. And the day was very fair, 
and the sea so wonderfully blue that it appeared to be as though the blue sky had melted into water and the water into the sky. As Vivian and the queen sat in this beautiful place, the queen said to the damsel, Vivian, what wouldst thou rather have than anything else in all the world? To which Vivian replied, Lady, I would rather have such wisdom as thou hast than anything else. Then Queen Morgana laughed and said, It is possible for thee to be as wise as I am, and wiser too, if so be thou wilt do according to my ordination, for I know a way in which thou mayest obtain wisdom. How may I obtain that wisdom, lady? said Vivian. Then Queen Morgana le Fay said, Hearken, and I will tell thee. Thou must know that Merlin, whom thou hast several times seen at the court of King Arthur, is the master of all the wisdom that is possible for any one to possess in this world. All that I know of magic, Merlin hath taught me, and he knoweth many things that he did not teach me, but which he withheld from me. For Merlin taught me when I was a young damsel at the court of my mother's husband, because I was beautiful in his eyes. For Merlin loveth beauty above all things else in the world, and so he taught me many things of magic, and was very patient with me. But Merlin hath a gift which belongeth to him, and which he cannot communicate to any one else, for it is instinct with him. That gift is the gift of foreseeing into the future, and the power of prophesying thereupon. Yet, though he may foresee the fate of others, still he is blind to his own fate. For so he confessed to me several times, that he could not tell what was to happen in his own life when that happening concerned himself alone. Now thou, Vivian, art far more beautiful than I was at thine age, Wherefore I believe that thou wilt easily attract the regard of Merlin unto thee. And if I give thee, besides, a certain charm which I possess, I may cause it to be that Merlin may love thee so much that he will impart to thee a great deal more of his wisdom than ever he taught me when I was his disciple. But thou art to know, Vivian, that in winning this gift of knowledge from Merlin, thou wilt put thyself in great peril. For by and by, when the charm of thy beauty shall have waned with him, then he may easily regret what he hath done in imparting his wisdom to thee, in the which case there will be great danger that he may lay some spell upon thee to deprive thee of thy powers, for it would be impossible that both thou and he could live in the same world, and each of ye know so much cunning of magic. Now unto all this Vivian listened with a great deal of attention, and when Queen Morgana had ended, the damsel said, Dear lady, all that thou tellest me is very wonderful and I find myself possessed with a vehement desire to attain such knowledge in magic as that. Wherefore, if thou wilt help me in this matter, so that I may beguile his wisdom from Merlin, thou wilt make of me a debtor unto thee for as long as I may live. And touching the matter of any danger that may fall to me in this affair, I am altogether willing to assume that, for I have a great hope that I may be able so to protect myself from Merlin that no harm shall befall me. For when I have drawn all the knowledge that I am able to obtain from him, then I will use that same knowledge to cast such a spell upon him that he shall never be able to harm me or anyone else again. 
In this I shall play my wit against his wisdom, and my beauty against his cunning, and I believe that I shall win at that game. Then Queen Morgana fell a-laughing beyond all measure, and when she had stinted her laughter, she cried, Hey, Vivian, certes thou art cunning beyond anything that I ever heard tell of, and I believe that thou art as wicked as thou art cunning. For who ever heard of a child of fifteen years old who would speak such words as thou hast just now spoken? Or whoever could suppose that so young a girl could conceive the thought of compassing the downfall of the wisest magician who hath ever lived? Then Queen Morgana le Fay set to her lips a small whistle of ivory and gold, and blew very shrilly upon it. And in reply there came running a young page of her court. Queen Morgana commanded him to bring to her a certain casket of alabaster, cunningly carved and adorned with gold and set with several precious stones. And Queen Morgana opened the box and took from within it two rings of pure yellow gold, beautifully wrought and set, the one ring with a clear white stone of extraordinary brilliancy, and the other with a stone as red as blood. Then Queen Morgana said, Vivian, behold these two rings. They possess each a spell of wonderful potency. For if thou wearest that ring with the white stone, whoever weareth the ring with the red stone shall love thee with such a passion of love that thou mayest do with him whatever thou hast a will to do. So take these rings and go to King Arthur's court and use them as thy cunning may devise. So Vivian took the two rings and gave Queen Morgana le Fay thanks beyond all measure for them. Now King Arthur took much pleasure in holding a great feast each Pentecost, at which time his court was gathered about him with much mirth and rejoicing. At such times it delighted him to have some excellent entertainment for to amuse himself and his court, Wherefore it befell that nearly always something happened that gave much entertainment to the king. So came the Feast of Pentecost, and King Arthur sat at the table with a great many noble and lordly folk and several kings and queens. Now as they all sat at that feast, their spirits greatly expanded with mirth and good cheer, there suddenly came into the hall a very beautiful young damsel, and with her a dwarf, wonderfully misshapen and of a very hideous countenance. And the maiden was dressed all in flame-colored satin, very rich, and with beautiful embroidery of gold and embroidery of silver. And her hair, which was red like gold, was coiled into a net of gold, and her eyes were black as coals and extraordinarily bright and glistening. And she had about her throat a necklace of gold of three strands, so that with all that gold and those bright garments, she shone with wonderful splendor as she entered the hall. Likewise, the dwarf who accompanied her was clad all in flame-colored raiment, and he bore in his hands a cushion of flame-colored silk with tassels of gold, and upon the cushion he bare a ring of exceeding beauty set with a red stone. So when King Arthur beheld this beautiful maiden, he supposed nothing else than that there was some excellent entertainment, and at that he rejoiced a very great deal. But when he looked well at the damsel, it appeared to him that he knew her face. Wherefore he said to her, Damsel, who art thou? Sir, 
she said. I am the daughter of the King of Northumberland, and my name is Vivian. And thereat King Arthur was satisfied. Then King Arthur said to her, Lady, what is that that thou hast upon yonder cushion? And why hast thou honoured us by coming hitherward? To the which Vivian made reply, Lord, I have here a very good entertainment for to give you pleasure at this feast of Pentecost. For here is a ring of such a sort that only he who is the most wise and the most worthy of all men here present may wear it. And King Arthur said, let us see the ring. So Vivian took the ring from the cushion which the dwarf held, and she came and brought it unto King Arthur, and the king took the ring into his own hand. And he perceived that the ring was extraordinarily beautiful, wherefore he said, Maiden, have I thy leave to try this ring upon my finger? And Vivian said, Yea, Lord. So King Arthur made attempt to place the ring upon his finger. But lo, the ring shrank in size so that it would not pass beyond the first joint thereof. Wherefore King Arthur said, It would appear that I am not worthy to wear this ring. Then the damsel Vivian said, have I my lord's leave to offer this ring to others of his court? And King Arthur said, Let the others try the ring. So Vivian took the ring to the various folk of the court, both lords and ladies, but not one of these could wear the ring. Then last of all, Vivian came to the place where Merlin sat, and she kneeled upon the ground before him, and offered the ring to him. And Merlin, because this concerned himself, could not forecast into the future to know that harm was intended to him. Nevertheless, he looked sourly upon the damsel, and he said, Child, what is this silly trick thou offerest me? Sir, quoth Vivian, I beseech you for to try this ring upon your finger. Then Merlin regarded the damsel more closely, and he perceived that she was very beautiful, wherefore his heart softened toward her a great deal. So he spake more gently unto her, and he said, Wherefore should I take the ring? To the which she made reply, because I believe that thou art the most wise and the most worthy of any man in all this place, wherefore the ring should belong to thee. Then Merlin smiled, and took the ring, and placed it upon his finger, and lo, it fitted the finger exactly. Thereupon Vivian cried out, See? The ring hath fitted his finger, and he is the most wise and the most worthy. And Merlin was greatly pleased that the ring which the beautiful damsel had given him had fitted his finger in that way. Then, after a while, he would have withdrawn the ring again, but, behold, he could not for the ring had grown to his finger as though it were a part of the flesh and the bone thereof. At this Merlin became much troubled in spirit, and very anxious, for he did not understand what might be meant by the magic of the ring. So he said, Lady, whence came this ring? And Vivian said, Sir, Thou knowest all things. Dost thou then not know that this ring was sent hitherward from Morgana le Fay? Then again Merlin was greatly a doubt, and he said, I hope there may be no evil in this ring. 
and Vivian smiled upon him and said, What evil could there be in it? Now by this time, the great magic that was in the ring began to work upon Merlin's spirit, wherefore he regarded Vivian very steadily, and suddenly he took great pleasure in her beauty. Then the magic of the ring gat entire hold upon him, and lo, a wonderful passion immediately seized upon his heart, and wrung it so that it was pierced as with a violent agony. And Vivian beheld what passed in Merlin's mind, and she laughed and turned away. And several others who were there also observed the very strange manner in which Merlin regarded her. Wherefore they said among themselves, Of a surety, Merlin is bewitched by the beauty of that young damoiselle. So after that time, the enchantment of the ring of Morgana le Fay so wrought upon Merlin's spirit that he could in no wise disentangle himself from Vivian's witchery. For from that day forth, whithersoever she went, there he might be found not far away. And if she was in the garden, he would be there. And if she was in the hall, he also would be there. And if she went a-hawking, he would also be a horseback. And all the court observed these things and made themselves merry and jested upon it. But Vivian hated Merlin with all her might for she saw that they all made merry at that folly of Merlin's, and he wearied her with his regard. But she dissembled this disregard before his face and behaved to him in all ways as though she had a great friendship for him. Now it happened upon a day that Vivian sat in the garden, and it was wonderfully pleasant summer weather, and Merlin came into the garden and beheld Vivian where she sat. But when Vivian perceived Merlin coming, she suddenly felt so great a disregard for him that she could not bear for to be nigh him at that time. Wherefore she arose in haste with intent to escape from him. But Merlin hurried and overtook her, and he said to her, Child, do you then hate me? And Vivian said, Sir, I do not hate you. But Merlin said, In very truth I believe that you do hate me. And Vivian was silent. Then in a little Merlin said, I would that I knew what I might do for you, so that you would cease to hate me. For I find that I have a wonderful love for you. Upon this, Vivian looked at Merlin very strangely. And by and by she said, Sir, if you would only impart your wisdom and your cunning unto me, then I believe that I could love you a very great deal. For behold, I am but as a young child in knowledge, and thou art so old and so wise that I am afraid of thee. If thou wouldst teach me thy wisdom so that I might be thine equal, then haply I might grow to have such a regard for thee as thou wouldst have me feel. Upon this Merlin looked very steadily at Vivian, and he said, Damsel, Thou art certes no such foolish child as thou dost proclaim thyself to be, for I see that thine eyes are very bright with a cunning beyond thy years. Now I misdoubt that if I should teach thee the wisdom which thou dost desire to possess, either it would be to thy undoing or else it would be to my undoing. Then Vivian cried out with a very loud and piercing voice, Merlin, if thou dost love me, teach me thy wisdom and the cunning of thy magic, 
and then I will love thee beyond anyone else in all the world. But Merlin sighed very deeply, for his heart misgave him. Then, by and by, he said, Vivian, thou shalt have thy will, and I will teach thee all those things of wisdom and magic that thou desirest to know. Upon this, Vivian was filled with such vehement agony of joy that she did not dare to let Merlin look into her countenance, lest he should read what was therein written. Wherefore, she cast down her eyes and turned her face away from him. Then, in a little while, she said, Master, when wilt thou teach me that wisdom? To this Merlin made reply, I shall not teach thee today, nor tomorrow, nor at this place, for I can only teach thee those knowledges in such solitude that there shall be nothing to disturb thy studies. But tomorrow thou shalt tell King Arthur that thou must return unto thy father's kingdom. Then we will depart together, accompanied by thy court, and when we have come to some secluded place, there I will build a habitation, by means of my magic, and we shall abide therein until I have instructed thee in wisdom. Then Vivian made great joy, and she caught Merlin's hand in hers, and she kissed his hand with great passion. So the next day, Vivian besought King Arthur that he would give her leave to return unto her father's court, and upon the third day she and Merlin and a number of attendants who were in service upon the damsel quitted the court of King Arthur and departed as though to go upon their way to the kingdom of Northumberland. But after they had gone some little distance from the court of the king, they turned to the eastward and took their way toward a certain valley of which Merlin was acquainted, and which was so fair and pleasant a place that it was sometimes called the Valley of Delight and sometimes the Valley of Joyousness. End of Section 22 Recording by The Story Girl Section 23 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Story Girl. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. Chapter Second How Merlin journeyed with Vivian unto the Valley of Joyousness, and how he builded for her a castle at that place. Also how he taught her the wisdom of magic, and of how she compassed his downfall thereby. So Merlin and Vivian, and those who were with them, travelled for three days to the eastward, until Toward the end of the third day, they reached the confines of a very dark and dismal forest. And there they beheld before them trees so thickly interwoven together that the eyes could not see anything at all of the sky because of the thickness of the foliage. And they beheld the branches and the roots of the trees that they appeared like serpents all twisted together. Wherefore Vivian said, Sir, this is a very dismal woodland. Yea, said Merlin, so it appeareth to be. Nevertheless, there lieth within this forest that place which is called by some the Valley of Joyousness, and by others the Valley of Delight, because of the great beauty of that place. 
and there are several pathways extending through this forest by the means of which that valley may be reached by a man, whether a horse or a foot. And after a while they found it was as Merlin said, for they came by and by upon one of those pathways and entered it and penetrated into the forest. And lo, within that doleful woodland, it was so dark that it appeared as though night-time had fallen, although it was bright daylight beyond the borders thereof. Wherefore, many of that party were very much afraid. But Merlin ever gave them good cheer, and so they went forward upon their way. So, by and by, they came out at last from that place and into the open again, whereat they were greatly rejoiced and took much comfort. Now by this time the evening had come, very peaceful and tranquil, and they beheld beneath them a valley spread out in that light, and it was wonderfully beautiful. And in the center of the valley was a small lake, so smooth and clear like to crystal, that it appeared like an oval shield of pure silver laid down upon the ground. And all about the margin of the lake were level meadows covered over with an incredible multitude of flowers of divers colors and kinds, very beautiful to behold. When Vivian saw this place, she cried unto Merlin, Master, this is indeed a very joyous valley, for I do not believe that the blessed meadows of paradise are more beautiful than this. And Merlin said, Very well, let us go down into it. So they went down, and as they descended, the night fell apace, and the round moon arose into the sky, and it was hard to tell whether that valley was the more beautiful in the daytime, or whether it was the more beautiful when the moon shone down upon it in that wise. So they all came at last unto the borders of the lake, and they perceived that there was neither house nor castle at that place. Now upon this, the followers of Merlin murmured amongst themselves, saying, This enchanter hath brought us hitherward, but how will he now provide for us that we may find a resting place that may shelter us from the inclement changes of the weather? For the beauty of this spot cannot alone shelter us from rain and storm. And Merlin overheard their murmurings, and he said, Peace! Take ye no trouble upon that matter, for I will very soon provide ye a good resting place. Then he said to them, Stand ye a little distance aside, till I show ye what I shall do. So they withdrew a little, as he commanded them, and he and Vivian remained where they were. And Vivian said, Master, what wilt thou do? And Merlin said, Wait a little, and thou shalt see. Therewith he began a certain very powerful conjuration, so that the earth began for to tremble and to shake, and an appearance as of a great red dust arose into the air. And in this dust there began to appear sundry shapes and forms, and these shapes and forms arose very high into the air, and by and by those who gazed thereon perceived that there was a great structure apparent in the midst of the cloud of red dust. Then, after a while, all became quiet, and the dust slowly disappeared from the air, and behold, there was the appearance of a marvellous castle, such as no one there had ever beheld before, even in a dream, for the walls thereof were of ultramarine and vermilion, 
and they were embellished and adorned with figures of gold, wherefore that castle showed in the moonlight like as it were a pure vision of great glory. Now Vivian beheld all that Merlin had accomplished, and she went unto him and kneeled down upon the ground before him and took his hand and set it to her lips. And while she kneeled thus, she said, Master, this is assuredly the most wonderful thing in the world. Wilt thou then teach me such magic, that I may be able to build a castle like this castle out of the elements? And Merlin said, Yea, all this will I teach thee, and more besides. For I will teach thee not only how thou mayest create such a structure as this out of invisible things, but will also teach thee how thou mayest, with a single touch of thy wand, dissipate that castle instantly into the air, even as a child with a stroke of a straw may dissipate a beautiful shining bubble, which upon an instant is, and upon another instant is not. And I will teach thee more than that, for I will teach thee how to change and transform a thing into the semblance of a different thing. And I will teach thee spells and charms such as thou didst never hear tell of before. Then Vivian cried out, Master, thou art the most wonderful man in all the world. And Merlin looked upon Vivian and her face was very beautiful in the moonlight, and he loved her a very great deal. Wherefore he smiled upon her and said, Vivian, dost thou still hate me? And she said, Nay, master. But she spake not the truth, for in her heart she was evil and the heart of Merlin was good, and that which is evil will always hate that which is good. Wherefore, though Vivian lusted for the knowledge of necromancy, and though she spake so lovingly with her lips, yet in her spirit she both feared and hated Merlin because of his wisdom. For she wist right well that except for the enchantment of that ring which he wore, Merlin would not love her any longer in that wise. Wherefore she said in her heart, If Merlin teaches me all of his wisdom, then the world cannot contain both him and me. Now Merlin abided with Vivian in that place for a year and a little more, and in that time he taught her all of magic that he was able to impart. So at the end of that time he said unto her, Vivian, I have now taught thee so much that I believe there is no one in all of the world who knoweth more than thou dost of these things of magic which thou hast studied in this time. For not only hast thou such power of sorcery that thou canst make the invisible elements take form at thy will, and not only canst thou transform at thy will one thing into the appearance of an altogether different thing, but thou hast such potent magic in thy possession that thou mayest entangle any living soul into the meshes thereof unless that one hath some very good talisman to defend himself from thy wiles. Nor have I myself very much more power than this that I have given to thee. So said Merlin, and Vivian was filled with great joy. And she said in her heart, Now, Merlin, if I have the good fortune to entangle thee in my spells, then shalt thou never behold the world again. Now, when the next day had come, Vivian caused a very noble feast to be prepared for herself and Merlin, 
and by means of the knowledge which Merlin had imparted to her, she produced a certain very potent sleeping potion, which was altogether without taste. This potion she herself infused into a certain noble wine, and the wine she poured into a golden chalice of extraordinary beauty. So when that feast was ended, and while she and Merlin sat together, Vivian said, Master, I have a mind to do thee a great honour. And Merlin said, What is it? Thou shalt see, said Vivian. Therewith she smote her hands together, and there immediately came a young page unto where they were. And he bare that chalice of wine in his hand, and gave it unto Vivian. Then Vivian took the chalice, and she went to where Merlin sat, and kneeled down before him, and said, Sir, I beseech thee to take this chalice, and to drink the wine that is within it. For as that wine is both very noble and very precious, so is thy wisdom both very noble and very precious, and as the wine is contained within a chalice of priceless cost, so is thy wisdom contained within a life that hath been beyond all value to the world. Therewith she set her lips to the chalice and kissed the wine that was in it. Then Merlin suspected no evil, but he took the chalice and quaffed of the wine with great cheerfulness. After that, in a little, the fumes of that potent draught began to arise into the brains of Merlin, and it was as though a cloud descended upon his sight. And when this came upon him, he was presently aware that he was betrayed, wherefore he cried out thrice in a voice, very bitter and full of agony, Whoa, whoa, whoa! And then he cried out, I am betrayed! And therewith he strove to arise from where he sat, but he could not. That while Vivian sat with her chin upon her hands, and regarded him very steadily, smiling strangely upon him. So presently, Merlin ceased his struggles, and sank into a sleep so deep that it was almost as though he had gone dead. And when that had happened, Vivian arose and leaned over him, and set a very powerful spell upon him. And she stretched out her forefinger, and wove an enchantment all about him, so that it was as though he was entirely encompassed with a silver web of enchantment. And when she had ended, Merlin could move neither hand nor foot, nor even so much as a fingertip, but was altogether like some great insect that a cunning and beautiful spider had enmeshed in a network of fine, strong web. Now when the next morning had come, Merlin awoke from his sleep, and he beheld that Vivian sat over against him, regarding him very narrowly. And they were in the same room in which she had fallen asleep. And when Vivian perceived that Merlin was awake, she laughed and said, Merlin, how is it with thee? And Merlin groaned with great passion, saying, Vivian, thou hast betrayed me. At this, Vivian laughed again very shrilly and piercingly, and she said, Behold, Merlin, thou art altogether in my power, for thou art utterly inwoven in those enchantments which thou thyself hast taught me. For lo, thou canst not move a single hair without my will. And when I leave thee, the world shall see thee no more, and all thy wisdom shall be my wisdom, 
and all thy power shall be my power. And there shall be no other in the whole world who shall possess the wisdom which I possess. Then Merlin groaned with such fervor that it was as though his heart would burst asunder. And he said, Vivian, thou hast brought me to such shame that even were I released from this spell, I could not endure that any man should ever see my face again. For I grieve not for my undoings so much as I grieve at the folly that hath turned mine own wisdom against me to my destruction. So I forgive thee all things that thou hast done to me to betray me. Yet there is one thing alone which I crave of thee. And Vivian said, Does it concern thee? And Merlin said, No, it concerns another. Thereupon Vivian said, What is it? Then Merlin said, It is this. Now I have received my gift of foresight again. And I perceive that King Arthur is presently in great peril of his life. So I beseech thee, Vivian, that thou wilt straightway go to where he is in danger, and that thou wilt use thy powers of sorcery for to save him. Thus, by fulfilling this one good deed, thou shalt haply lessen the sin of this that thou hadst done to betray me. Now at that time, Vivian was not altogether bad as she afterward became, for she still felt some small pity for Merlin and some small reverence for King Arthur. Wherefore now she laughed and said, Very well, I will do thy desire in this matter. Whither shall I go to save that king? Then Merlin replied, Go into the west country, and unto the castle of a certain knight, hight Sir Thomas de Noir. And when thou comest there, then thou shalt immediately see how thou mayest be of aid to the good king. Upon this Vivian said, I will do this thing for thee, for it is the last favor that any one may ever render unto thee in this world. Therewith Vivian smote her hands together and summoned many of her attendants. And when these had come in, she presented Merlin before them, and she said, Behold how I have bewitched him. Go, see for yourselves. Feel of his hands and his face, and see if there be any life in him. And they went to Merlin and felt of him, his hands and arms and his face, and even they plucked at his beard. And Merlin could not move in any wise, but only groan with great dolor. So they all laughed and made them merry at his woeful state. Then Vivian caused it by means of her magic that there should be in that place a great coffer of stone. And she commanded those who were there that they should lift Merlin up and lay him therein, and they did as she commanded. Then she caused it that by means of her magic there should be placed a huge slab of stone upon that coffer such as ten men could hardly lift, and Merlin lay beneath that stone like one who was dead. Then Vivian caused it to be that the magic castle should instantly disappear, and so it befell as she willed. Then she caused it that a mist should arise at that place, and the mist was of such a sort that no one could penetrate into it, or sever it asunder, nor could any human eye see what was within. Then, when she had done all this, 
she went her way with all her court from that valley making great joy in that she had triumphed over merlin nevertheless she did not forget her promise but went to the castle of sir domus de moir and after a while it shall all be told how it befell at that place such was the passing of merlin and god grant it that you may not so misuse the wisdom he giveth you to have that it may be turned against you to your undoing for there can be no greater bitterness in the world than this that a man shall be betrayed by one to whom he himself hath given the power of betraying him and now turn we unto king arthur to learn how it fell with him after merlin had thus been betrayed to his undoing end of section 23 recording by the story girl Section 24 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Story Girl. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. Chapter Third How Queen Morgana Le Fay returned to Camelot and to the court with intent to do ill to King Arthur. Also, how King Arthur and others went a hunting, and of what befell thereby. Now, after Merlin had quitted the court with Vivian in that manner aforetold, Queen Morgana Le Fay returned again to Camelot. There she came unto King Arthur, and kneeled before him, bowing her face with an appearance of great humility. And she said, Brother, I have meditated much upon these matters that have passed, and I perceive that I have done very ill to talk against thee as I have done, and to be so rebellious against thy royalty. Wherefore, I crave of thee to forgive me my evil words and thoughts against thee. Then King Arthur was very much moved, and he came to Queen Morgana and took her by the hand and lifted her up upon her feet and kissed her brow and her eyes, saying, My sister, I have no ill will against thee, but nothing but love for thee in my heart. And so Queen Morgana Le Fay abode at the court in the same manner as she had aforetime done, for King Arthur believed that they were reconciled. Now one day Queen Morgana and the king fell into a friendly talk concerning Excalibur, and Queen Morgana Le Fay expressed a very great desire to see that noble weapon more closely than she had yet done. And King Arthur said he would sometimes show it to her. So the next day he said, Sister, come with me and I will show thee Excalibur. Therewith he took Queen Morgana by the hand and led her into another apartment where was a strong wooden coffer bound with bands of iron. Then the king opened the coffer and therein Queen Morgana Le Fay beheld Excalibur, where he lay in his sheath. Then King Arthur said to her, Lady, take this sword and examine it as you please. Therewith Queen Morgana took Excalibur into her hands and lifted him out of the coffer. And she drew the sword out of the sheath, and lo, the blade flashed like lightning. Then she said, Sir, this is a very beautiful sword, 
and I would that I might take it hence and keep it for a little, so that I might enjoy it in full measure. Now King Arthur was of a mind to show the queen great courtesy at this time of their reconciliation. Wherefore he said to her, Take it, and be thou its keeper for as long as thou wilt. So Queen Morgana took Excalibur and his sheath, and bare them away with her to her inn, and she hid the sword in the bed in which she slept. Then Queen Morgana sent for sundry goldsmiths, eight in number, and for certain armorsmiths, eight in number, and for certain cunning jewelers, eight in number. And she said unto them, Make me a sword in every particular like this sword that I have here. And thereupon she showed them Excalibur in his sheath. So these goldsmiths and armorsmiths and lapidaries labored with great diligence, and in a fortnight they had made a sword so exactly like Excalibur that no eye could have told the difference betwixt the one and the other. And Queen Morgana le Fay kept both swords by her until her purposes should have been fulfilled. It befell upon a certain day that King Arthur proclaimed a hunt, and he and all of his court were party thereunto. Now the day before this hunt took place, Queen Morgana le Fay came to King Arthur and said, Brother, I have here for thee a very beautiful and noble horse, which I intend to give thee as a gift of love. And therewith she called aloud, and there came two grooms bringing a horse, as black as jet, and all beset with trappings and harness of silver. And the horse was of such extraordinary beauty, that neither King Arthur nor anybody who was with him had ever before seen its like for beauty. So a wonderful delight possessed the king at sight of the horse, and he said, Sister, this is the noblest gift I have had given to me for this long time. Ha, brother, quoth Queen Morgana, doth that horse then be like thee? Yea, said King Arthur, it belikes me more than any horse that I ever beheld before. Then, quoth Queen Morgana, Consider it as a gift of reconciliation betwixt thee and me. And in sign of that reconciliation, I beg of thee that thou wilt ride that horse forth upon the hunt to-morrow day. And King Arthur said, I will do so. So the next day he rode forth to the hunt upon that horse as he said that he would do. Now it happened some time after noon that the hounds started a heart of extraordinary size, and the king and all of his court followed the chase with great eagerness. But the horse of King Arthur soon outstripped all the other horses, saving only that of a certain very honorable and worthy knight of the court, hight Sir Accolon of Gaul. So Sir Accolon and the king rode at a great pace through the forest, and they were so eager with the chase that they wist not whither they were riding. And at last they overtook the hart, and found that it was embushed in a certain very thick and tangled part of the forest. And there King Arthur slew the stag, and so the chase was ended. Now after this had come to pass, the king and Sir Accolon would have retraced their way whither they had come, but in a little they perceived that they were lost in the mazes of the woodland, and wist not where they were. For they had followed the chase so far that they were in an altogether strange country. So they wandered hither and thither at great length until eventide, at which time they were oppressed with hunger and weariness. 
Then King Arthur said to Sir Accalon, Messire, meseems we shall have nowhere to rest ourselves tonight, unless it be beneath a tree in this forest. To this Sir Accalon made reply, Lord, if thou wilt follow my counsel, thou wilt let our horses seek their own way through this wilderness. So haply, because of the instinct of such creatures, they shall bring us unto some place of habitation. Now this advice appeared to be very good to King Arthur, wherefore he did as Sir Accalon advised, and let loose his bridle rein and allowed his horse to travel as it listed. So King Arthur's horse went along a certain path, and Sir Accalon followed after the king. And they went a great pass in this wise, and the night was descending upon them in the forest. But before it was entirely dark, they emerged out of that forest and into an open place where they beheld before them a very wide estuary as it were an inlet of the sea, and before them was a beach of sand, very smooth and white, and they too went down to that beach, and stood upon the shore, and they wist not what to do, for there was no habitation in sight in any direction. Now whilst they stood there a doubt, they suddenly perceived a ship, at a very great distance away. And this ship approached where they were sailing very rapidly. As the ship drew nigh to that place, they perceived that it was a very strange and wonderful appearance, for it was painted in many divers colors, very gaudy and brilliant. And the sails were all of cloth of silk, woven in divers colors and embroidered with figures like to the figures of a tapestry. And King Arthur was very greatly amazed at the appearance of that ship. Now as they stood so watching the ship, they perceived that it drew nigher and nigher to that place where they were, and in a little it beached itself upon the shore of sand, not very far away from them. Then King Arthur said to Sir Accalon, Sir, let us go forward to the shore where we may look into this ship, for never did I see its like before in all of my life. Wherefore I have a thought that maybe it is fay. So they too went to where the ship was, and they stood upon the shore and looked down into it, and at first they thought that there was no one upon board of the ship, for it appeared to be altogether deserted. But as they stood there marveling at the wonderfulness of that ship, and at the manner in which it had come thither, they beheld of a sudden that certain curtains that hung before an apartment at the farther extremity of the ship were parted asunder and there came forth from that place twelve very beautiful damsels. Each of these was clad in a rich garment of scarlet satin, very bright and shining, and each wore around her head a circlet of gold, and each had many bracelets of gold upon her arms. These damsels came forward unto where the two knights were, and they said, Welcome, King Arthur. And they said, Welcome, Sir Agalon. At this, King Arthur was very much astonished that they should know him, and he said, Fair ladies, how is this? Ye appear to know me very well, but I know ye not. Who are ye that know me and my companion, and call us by name? Unto this, the chiefest of those damsels made reply, Sir, we are part fay, and we know all about you, and we know how that ye have been following a very long chase, and we know that ye are weary, and hungered, and athirst. Wherefore we beseech ye that ye come aboard of this ship, and rest, and refresh yourselves with food and drink. 
Now, this appeared to King Arthur to be a very bell adventure, wherefore he said to Sir Accalon, Monsieur, I have a great mind for to go aboard this ship and to follow out this adventure. And Sir Accalon said, Lord, if thou goest, I will go also. So those ladies let fall a gangplank from the ship, and King Arthur and Sir Accalon drave their horses up the gangplank and aboard the ship, and immediately they did so, the ship withdrew itself from the sands and sailed away as it had come, very swiftly. And it was now the early night-time, with the moon very round and full in the sky, like to a disk of pure, shining silver. Then those twelve damoiselles aided King Arthur and Sir Accalon to dismount, and some took their horses away, and others led them into a fair chamber at the end of the ship. And in this chamber King Arthur beheld that a table had been placed as though for their entertainment, spread with a linen cloth, and set with divers savoury meats, and with manchets of white bread, and with several different sorts of excellent wines. And at the sight King Arthur and Sir Accalon were very much rejoiced, for they were very greatly unhungered. So they immediately sat themselves down at that table, and they ate and drank with great heartiness. And whilst they did so, some of those damsels served them with food, and others held them in pleasant discourse, and others made music upon lutes and citterns for their entertainment. So they feasted and made very merry. But after a while, a very great drowsiness of sleep began to descend upon King Arthur, albeit he deemed that that drowsiness had come upon him because of the weariness of the chase. So presently he said, Fair damsels, <laughs> ye have refreshed us a very great deal, and this hath been a very pleasant adventure. But I would now that ye had a place for us to sleep, Unto this the chiefest of the damsels replied, Lord, this boat hath been prepared for your refreshment, wherefore all things have been made ready for you with entire fullness. Therewith some of those twelve damsels conducted King Arthur into a sleeping chamber that had been prepared for him, and others led Sir Accalon into another chamber prepared for him. And King Arthur marveled at the beauty of his chamber, for he thought that he had never beheld a more excellently bedight bedchamber than that one into which he now entered. So King Arthur laid himself down with much comfort to his body, and straightway he fell into a deep and gentle sleep without dream or disturbance of any sort. Now when King Arthur awoke from that sleep, he was astonished beyond all measure, so that he wist not whether he was still asleep and dreaming, or whether he was awake. For lo, he lay upon a pallet in a very dark and dismal chamber all of stone, and he perceived that this chamber was a dungeon, and all about him he heard the sound of many voices in woeful complaint. Then King Arthur said to himself, Where is that ship in which I was last night? And what hath become of those ladies with whom I spake? Upon this he looked about him, and behold, he saw that he was indeed in a dungeon, and that there were many knights in very sad estate all about him. Wherefore he perceived that they also were captives, and that it was they who had made that sound of woeful lamentation which he had heard when awaking. Then King Arthur aroused himself from where he lay, 
and he saw that all those knights who were prisoners there were strangers unto him, and he knew not them, and they knew not him. And of these knights there were two and twenty who were prisoners in that place. Then King Arthur said, Messieurs, who are you, and where am I at this present? To the which the chiefest of those knights who were prisoners made reply, Sir, we are like yourself, prisoners in a dungeon of this castle, and the castle belongs to a certain knight, hight Sir Domus, surnamed Le Noir. Then King Arthur made great marvel at what had befallen him, wherefore he said, Messieurs, here is a very singular thing hath happened to me, for last night I was asleep in a very wonderful ship that I believe was Fay, and with me was a knight companion, and lo, this morning I awake alone in this dungeon, and know not how I came hither. Sir, said the knight, who spake for the others. Thou wert last night brought hither by two men clad in black, and thou wert laid down upon yonder pallet without awaking. Wherefore it is very plain to me that thou art in the same case that we are in, and that thou art a prisoner unto this Sir Domus Lenoir. Then King Arthur said, Tell me, who is this Sir Domus? For I declare that I never before heard of him. I will tell you, said the captive knight, and therewith he did so as follows. I believe, said he, that this Sir Domus is the falsest knight that liveth, for he is full of treason and leasing, and is altogether a coward in his heart. Yet he is a man of very great estate and very powerful in these parts. Now there are two brothers, and Sir Domus is one, and the other is Hight Sir Onslake, and Sir Domus is the elder, and Sir Onslake is the younger. When the father of these two knights died, he left the one an equal patrimony with the other. But now it hath come about that Sir Domus hath nearly all of those estates, and that Sir Onslake hath only one castle, which same he now holdeth by the force of arms and because of his own courage. For though Sir Domus is altogether a coward in his heart, yet he hath cunning and guile beyond any man of whom I ever heard tell. Wherefore it hath so come about but of his father's patrimony Sir Domus hath everything, and Sir Onslake hath nothing, saving only that one castle and the estate thereunto appertaining. Now it would appear to be very strange that Sir Domus is not satisfied with all this, yet he is not satisfied. But he covets that one castle and that small estate that is his brother's, so that he can hardly have any pleasure in life because of his covetousness. Yet he knoweth not how to obtain that estate from his brother, for Sir Onslake is a very excellent knight, and the only way that Sir Domus can lay hands upon that estate is by having to do with his brother as man to man in a contest at arms, and this he is afraid to attempt. So for a long time, Sir Domus hath been in search of a knight who may take up his case for him, and do battle against Sir Onslake in his behalf. Wherefore all the knights whom he can arrest he bringeth to this castle, and giveth them their choice, either to take up his case against his brother, or else to remain in this place as his prisoner without ransom. So he hath arrested all of us, and hath made demand of each that he should do battle in his behalf. But not one of us will take up the case of such an evil-conditioned knight as Sir Domus. So we all remain his prisoners. Well, quoth King Arthur, this is a very wonderful case. 
But methinks that if Sir Domus maketh his appeal to me, I will take up his case. For I would rather do that than remain a prisoner here for all my life. But if I should take upon me this battle and be successful therein, then I will afterward have to do with Sir Domus himself, in such a manner as I do not believe would be very much to his liking. Now a little while after this, the door of that prison house was opened by the porter, and there entered a very fair young damsel. And this damsel came to King Arthur, and she said to him, What cheer? I cannot tell, quoth King Arthur, but meseems I am in a very sorry pass in this place. Sir, said the damsel, I am grieved to see so noble appearing a knight in so dolorous a case. But if you will undertake to defend the cause of the lord of this castle with your person against his enemy, then you shall have leave to go whithersoever you please. To this King Arthur made reply, Lady, this is a very hard case, that either I must fight a battle I care not for, or else remain a prisoner here without ransom for all of my days. But I would liever fight than live here all my life. And so I will undertake that adventure as thou wouldst have me do. But if I do battle for the lord of this castle, and if I should have grace of heaven to win that battle, then it must be that all these, my companions in imprisonment, shall also go forth with me into freedom. To this the damsel said, very well, be it so, for that shall content the master of this castle. Then King Arthur looked more closely at the maiden, and he said, Damsel, meseems I should know thy face, for I think I have seen thee somewhere before this. Nay, sir, said she, that can hardly be for I am the daughter of the lord of this castle. But in this she was false, for she was one of the damsels of Morgana le Fay, and she was one of those who had beguiled King Arthur into the ship the night before, and it was she who had brought him to that castle and had delivered him into the hands of Sir Domus. And all these things she had done upon command of Queen Morgana le Fay. Then King Arthur said, But if I do this battle, thou must carry a message for me unto the court of King Arthur, and that message must be delivered unto Queen Morgana le Fay into her own hands. Then, when that is done, I will do this battle for the cause of Sir Domus. And the damsel said, It shall be done so. So King Arthur wrote a sealed letter to Queen Morgana le Fay that she should send to him his sword Excalibur, and he sent that message to her. And when Queen Morgana received that letter, she laughed and said, Very well. He shall have a sword that shall please his eye as well as Excalibur. And therewith she sent him that other sword that she had had made exactly like Excalibur. So Sir Domus sent word unto his brother Sir Onslake that he had now a champion for to do battle in his behalf to recover all that portion of their patrimony which Sir Onslake still withheld from him. Now when Sir Onslake received this message, he was thrown into great trouble of spirit. For a little while before, he had been very sorely wounded in a tournament, in the which a spear had been thrust through both his thighs, so that he was then abed with that wound and without power to arise therefrom. Wherefore he wist not what to do in this case, 
for he could not do battle upon his own behalf, and he had no one to do battle for him. End of section 24 Recording by The Story Girl Section 25 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dominic Trace Chapter 4 What Befell Sir Accolon, and How King Arthur Fought an Affair at Arms with Swords, and How He Came Nigh to Losing His Life Thereby. Here followeth the account of what happened unto Sir Accolon, the morning after he went aboard that magic ship with King Arthur as aforetold. Now when Sir Accolon awoke from that same sleep, it was with him as it had been with King Arthur, for at first he wist not whether he was still asleep and dreaming, or whether he was awake. For lo, he found himself to be lying beside a marble basin of clear water that gushed up very high from a silver tube, and he perceived that not far from this fountain was a large pavilion of party-colored silk, which stood upon the borders of a fair meadow of grass. So Sir Accolon was altogether astonished to find himself in this place when he had fallen asleep on board that ship, wherefore he was afraid that all this was the fruit of some very evil spell. So he crossed himself and said, God save King Arthur from any harm, for it seems to me that those damsels upon that ship have wrought some magic upon us, for to separate us the one from the other. So saying, he arose from where he lay with intent to inquire further into that matter. Now, as he made some noise in bestirring himself, there came forth from that pavilion aforementioned a very hideous dwarf, who saluted him with all civility and with high respect. Then Sir Accolon said to the dwarf, Sirrah, who are you? Unto which the dwarf made answer, Meshire, I belong to the lady of yonder pavilion, and she hath sent me to bid you welcome to this place, and to invite you in for to partake of a repast with her. Ha, quoth Sir Accolon, and how was it I came hither? Sir, said the dwarf, I do not know, but when we looked forth this morning we saw you lying there by the fountain side. Then Sir Accolon made great marvel at that which had happened to him, and by and by he said, Who is thy lady? To which the dwarf replied, She is hight the Lady Gomin of the Fair Hair, and she will be passingly glad of your company in her pavilion. Upon this Sir Accolon arose, and having laved himself at the fountain and so refreshed himself, he went with the dwarf unto the pavilion of that lady. And when he had come there, he saw that in the center of the pavilion was a table of silver spread with a fair white cloth, and covered with very excellent food for a man to break his fast withal. Now immediately Sir Accolon came into the pavilion, the curtains upon the further side thereof were parted, and there entered from a further chamber a very beautiful lady, and gave Sir Accolon welcome to that place. And Sir Accolon said to her, Lady, methinks thou art very civil to invite me thus into thy pavilion. Nay, sir, said the lady, it took no great effort to be civil unto a knight so worthy as thou. Then she said to Sir Accolon, Sir, wilt thou sit here at the table with me and break thy fast? At this Sir Accolon was very glad, for he was unhungered, and the beauty of the lady pleased him a very great deal, wherefore it afforded him great joy for to be in her company. So they two sat at the table with a very cheerful and pleasant spirit, and the dwarf waited upon them. Now after Sir Accolon and the lady of the pavilion had broken their fasts, she spake to him in this wise, Sir knight, thou appearest to be a very strong and worthy lord, and one very well used to feats of arms and to prowess in battle. To this Sir Accolon made reply, Lady, it does not beseem me to bespeak of my own worth, but this much I may freely say. I have engaged in several affrays at arms in such measure as a knight with belt and spurs may do, and I believe that both my friends and my enemies have had reason to say that I have at all times done my devoirs to the best of my powers. Then the damsel said, I believe you are a very brave and worthy knight, and being such you might be of service to a good worthy knight who is in sad need of such service as one knight may render unto another. To this Sir Accolon said, What is that service? And the damsel replied, I will tell thee. There is, dwelling not far from this place, a certain knight hight Sir Anslake, who hath an elder brother hight Sir Domus. This Sir Domus hath served Sir Anslake very ill in many ways, and hath deprived him of well nigh of all his patrimony, so that only a little is left to Sir Anslake of all the great possessions that were one time his father's. But even such a small holding as that Sir Domus begrudges Sir Anslake, 
so that Sir Ancelake must needs hold what he hath by such force of arms as he may himself maintain. Now Sir Domus hath found himself a champion, who is a man of a great deal of strength and prowess, and through this champion Sir Domus challenges Sir Ancelake's right to hold even that small part of those lands which were one time his father's. Wherefore, if Sir Ancelake would retain what is his, he must presently do battle therefore. Now this is a very sad case for Sir Ancelake, for a short time since he was wounded by a spear at a tournament, and was pierced through both of his thighs, wherefore he is not now able to sit upon his horse and to defend his rights against assault. Wherefore meseems that a knight could have no better cause to show his prowess than in the defense of so sad a case as this. So spake that lady, and to all she said Sir Accolon listened with great attention, and when she had ended he said, Lady, I would be indeed right willing to defend Sir Ancelake's right. But, lo, I have no armor, nor have I any arms to do battle withal. Then that damsel smiled very kindly upon Sir Accolon, and she said to him, Sir, Sir Ancelake may easily fit thee with armor that shall be altogether to thy liking. And as for arms, I have in this pavilion a sword that hath but one other fellow in all the world. Upon this she arose and went back into that curtained recess from which she had come, and thence she presently returned, bringing a certain thing wrapped in a scarlet cloth. And she opened the cloth before Sir Accolon's eyes, and lo, that which she had there was King Arthur's sword Excalibur in its sheath. Then the damsel said, This sword shall be thine if thou wilt assume this quarrel on behalf of Sir Ancelake. Now when Sir Accolon beheld that sword, he wist not what to think, and he said to himself, Certes, either this is Excalibur, or else it is his twin brother. Therewith he drew the blade from out of its shield, and it shined with extraordinary splendor. Then Sir Accolon said, I know not what to think for pure wonder, for this sword is indeed the very image of another sword I wot of. When he so spake, that damsel smiled upon him again, and she said, I have heard tell that there is in the world another sword like this. Then Sir Accolon said, Lady, to win this sword for myself, I would be willing to fight in any battle whatsoever. And the damsel replied, Then if thou wilt fight this battle for Sir Ancelake, thou art free to keep that sword for thine own at the which Sir Accolon was rejoiced beyond all measure of gladness. So it came about that, by the wiles of Queen Morgana le Fay, King Arthur was brought to fight a battle unknowingly with a knight very much beloved by him, and that knight had Excalibur to use against his master, for all these things had come to pass through the cunning of Morgana le Fay. Now a fair field was prepared for that battle in such a place as was convenient both to Sir Domus and to Sir Ancelake, and thither they came upon the day assigned, each with his knight champion and his attendants, Sir Ancelake being brought thither in a litter because of the sore wound in his thighs. Also a great many other folk came to behold the combat, for the news thereof had gone forth to a great distance around about that place. So all being in readiness, the two knights that were to do battle in that field were brought within the barriers of combat, each fully armed and each mounted upon a very good horse. Now King Arthur was clad all in armor of Sir Domus, and Sir Accolon was clad in armor that belonged to Sir Ancelake, and the head of each was covered by his helmet, so that neither of those two knew the other. Then the herald came forth and announced that the battle was toward, and each knight immediately put himself in readiness for the assault. Thereupon, the word for assault being given, the two rushed forth, each from his station, with such speed and fury that it was wonderful to behold. And so they met in the midst of the course with a roar as of thunder, and the spear of each knight was burst all into small pieces unto the truncheon which he held in his hand. Upon this each knight voided his horse with great skill and address, and allowed it to run at will in that field. And each threw aside the truncheon of his spear and drew his sword, and thereupon came the one against the other with the utmost fury of battle. It was at this time that Vivian came to the place upon the behest of Merlin, and she brought with her such a court and state of beauty that a great many people took notice of her with great pleasure. So Vivian and her court took stand at the barriers whence they might behold all that was toward. And Vivian regarded those two knights, and she could not tell which was King Arthur and which was his enemy. Wherefore she said, Well, I will do as Merlin desired me to do, but I must wait and see this battle for a while, ere I shall be able to tell which is King Arthur, for it would be a pity to cast my spells upon the wrong knight. So these two knights came together in battle afoot, and first they foined, and then they both struck at the same time, and lo, the sword of King Arthur did not bite into the armor of Sir Accolon, 
but the sword of sir accolon bit very deeply into the armor of king arthur and wounded him so sorely that the blood ran down in great quantities into his armor and after that they struck very often and very powerfully and as it was at first so it was afterward for the sword of sir accolon ever bit into the armor of king arthur and the sword of king arthur bit not at all into his enemy's armor so in a little while it came that king arthur's armor was stained all over red with the blood that flowed out from a great many wounds and sir accolon bled not at all because of the sheath of excalibur which he wore at his side and the blood of king arthur flowed down upon the ground so that all the grass around about was ensanguined with it so when king arthur beheld how all the ground was wet with his own blood and how his enemy bled not at all he began to fear that he would die in that battle wherefore he said to himself how is this hath the virtue departed out of excalibur and his sheath were it not otherwise i would think that that sword which cutteth me so sorely is excalibur and that this sword is not excalibur upon this a great despair of death came upon him and he ran at sir accolon and smote him so sore a blow upon the helm that sir accolon nigh fell down upon the ground but at that blow the sword of king arthur broke short off at the cross of the handle and fell into the grass among the blood and the pommel thereof and the cross thereof was all that king arthur held in his hand now at that blow sir accolon waxed very mad so he ran at king arthur with intent to strike him some dolorous blow but when he saw that king arthur was without weapon he paused in his assault and he said sir knight i see that thou art without weapon and that thou hast lost a great deal of blood wherefore i demand thee to yield thyself unto me as a recreant then king arthur was again very much adread that his death was near to him yet because of his royalty it was not possible for him to yield to any knight so he said nay sir knight i may not yield myself unto thee for i would liever die with honour than yield myself without honour for though i lack a weapon there are peculiar reasons why i may not lack worship wherefore thou mayest slay me as i am without weapon and that will be thy shame and not my shame well said sir accolon as for the shame i will not spare thee unless thou dost yield to me and king arthur said i will not yield me thereupon sir accolon said then stand thou away from me so that i may strike thee and when king arthur had done as sir accolon bade him sir accolon smote him such a woeful blow that the king fell down upon his knees then sir accolon raised excalibur with intent to strike king arthur again and with that all the people who were there cried out upon him to spare so worshipful a knight but sir accolon would not spare him then vivian said unto herself certes that must be king arthur who is so near to his death and i do make my vow that it would be a great pity for him to die after he hath fought so fiercely so when sir accolon raised his sword that second time with intent to strike his enemy vivian smote her hands with great force and emitted at that same time a spell of such potency that it appeared to sir accolon upon the instant as though he had received some very powerful blow upon his arm for with that spell his arm was benumbed all from the finger-tips unto the hollow of his armpit and thereupon excalibur fell out of sir accolon's hands and into the grass then king arthur beheld the sword and he perceived that it was excalibur and therewith he knew that he had been betrayed wherefore he cried out thrice in a very loud voice treason 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 and with that he set his knee upon the blade and before sir accolon could stay him he had seized it into his hands then it appeared to king arthur that a great virtue had come into him because of that sword wherefore he arose from his knees and ran at sir accolon and smote him so sorely that the blade penetrated his armour to the depth of half a palm's breadth and he smote him again and again and sir accolon cried out in a loud voice and fell down upon his hands and knees then king arthur ran to him and catched the sheath of excalibur and plucked it away from sir accolon and flung it away and thereupon the wounds of sir accolon burst out bleeding in great measure then king arthur catched the helmet of sir accolon and rushed it off his head with intent to slay him now because king arthur was blinded with his own blood he did not know sir accolon wherefore he said sir knight who art thou who hast betrayed me and sir accolon said i have not betrayed thee i am sir accolon of gaul and i am knight in good worship of king arthur's court but when king arthur heard this he made great outcry and he said how is this know you who i am and sir accolon said nay i know you not then king arthur said i am king arthur who am thy master and upon this he took off his helmet and sir accolon knew him and when sir accolon beheld king arthur he swooned away and lay like one dead upon the ground and king arthur said 
take him hence then when those who were there were aware who king arthur was they burst over the barriers and ran toward him with great outcry of pity and king arthur would have left this place but upon that he also swooned away because of the great issue of blood that had come from him wherefore all those who were round about took great sorrow thinking that he was dying wherefore they bewailed themselves without stint then came vivian out into that field and she said let me have him for i believe that i shall be able to cure his hurts so she commanded that two litters should be brought and she placed king arthur in one of the litters and she placed sir accolon in the other and she bore them both away to a priory of nuns that was at no great distance from that place so when vivian had come there she searched the wounds of king arthur and bathed them with a very precious balsam so that they immediately began to heal as for sir accolon she would not have to do with his wounds but let one of her attendants bathe him and dress his hurts now when the next morning had come king arthur was so much recovered that he was able to arise though very weak and sick nigh unto death so he got up from his couch and he would not permit any one to stay him and he wrapped a cloak about him and went to the place where sir accolon lay when he had come there he questioned sir accolon very narrowly and sir accolon told him all that had happened to him after he had left that ship and how the strange damsel had given him a sword for to fight with so when king arthur heard all that sir accolon had to tell him he said messire i think that thou art not to be blamed in this matter but i much do fear me that there is treachery here to compass my ruin then he went out from that place and he found vivian and he said to her damsel i beseech thee to dress the wounds of that knight with the same balsam that thou didst use to dress my wounds lord said vivian i cannot do so for i have no more of that balsam but what she said was false for she did have more of that balsam but she did not choose to use it upon sir accolon so that afternoon sir accolon died of his wounds which he had received in his battle with king arthur and that day king arthur summoned sir domus and sir Onslake into his presence and they came and stood before him so filled with the terror of his majesty that they had not the power to stand but fell down upon their knees unto him then king arthur said i will pardon you for ye knew not what ye did but thou sir domus i believe art a very false and treasonable knight wherefore i shall deprive thee of all thy possessions but that one single castle which thy brother had and that i shall give unto thee but all thy possessions i shall give unto sir Onslake, and i shall further ordain that thou shalt never hereafter have the right to ride upon any horse but a palfrey for thou art not worthy to ride upon a courser as a true knight hath a right to do and i command it of thee that thou shalt presently liberate all those knights who were my companions in captivity and thou shalt recompense them for all the injury that thou hast done to them according as it shall be decided by a court of chivalry therewith he dismissed those two knights and they were very glad that he had dealt so mercifully with them end of section twenty five recording by dominic trace Section 26 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dominic Trace. Conclusion Now shortly after that combat betwixt King Arthur and Sir Accolon, the news thereof was brought to Queen Morgana le Fay, and the next day thereafter she heard that Sir Accolon was dead and she wist not how it could be that her designs could have so miscarried then she was a doubt as to how much king arthur might know of her treachery so she said to herself i will go and see my brother the king and if he is aware of my treason i will beseech him to pardon my transgression so having made diligent inquiry as to where it was that king arthur lay she gathered together her court of knights and esquires and went thitherward so she came to that place upon the fifth day after the battle and when she had come there she asked of those who were in attendance what cheer the king had they answered her he is asleep and he must not be disturbed to which queen morgana le fay replied no matter i am not to be forbidden for i must presently see him and speak with him so they did not dare to stay her because she was the king's sister so queen morgana went into the chamber where the king lay and he did not waken at her coming then queen morgana was filled full of hatred and a great desire for revenge wherefore she said to herself i will take excalibur and its sheath and will carry them away with me to avalon and my brother shall never see them again 
so she went very softly to where king arthur lay and she looked upon him as he slept and perceived that he had excalibur beside him and that he held the handle of the sword in his hand while he slept then queen morgana said alas for this for if i try to take excalibur away from him haply he will awake and he will slay me for my treason then she looked and perceived where the sheath of excalibur lay at the foot of the couch so she took the sheath of excalibur very softly and she wrapped it up in her mantle and she went out thence and king arthur did not awaken at her going so queen morgana came out from the king's chamber and she said to those in attendance do not waken the king for he sleepeth very soundly therewith she mounted her horse and went her way from that place now after a considerable while king arthur awoke and he looked for the sheath of excalibur but he perceived that it was gone wherefore he said immediately who hath been here they in attendance made answer queen morgana le fay hath been here and she came in and saw you and went her way without waking you then king arthur's heart misgave him and he said i fear me that she hath dealt treacherously with me from the beginning to the end of these adventures whereupon he arose and summoned all his knights and esquires and mounted his horse for pursuit of queen morgana although he was still passing sick and faint from his sore wounds and loss of blood now as the king was about ready to depart vivian came to him where he was and she said lord take me with thee for if thou dost not do so thou wilt never recover excalibur his sheath nor wilt thou ever overtake queen morgana le fay and king arthur said come with me damsel in god's name so vivian went with him in pursuit of queen morgana now by and by as she fled queen morgana le fay looked behind her and therewith she perceived that vivian was with the party of king arthur wherefore her heart failed her and she said i fear me that i am now altogether ruined for i have aided that damsel to acquire such knowledge of magic that i shall have no spells to save myself from her counterspell but at any rate it shall be that king arthur shall never have the sheath of excalibur again for to help him in his hour of need now at that time they were passing beside the margin of a lake of considerable size so queen morgana le fay took the sheath of excalibur in both her hands and swung it by its belt above her head and she threw it a great distance out into the water then lo a very singular miracle happened for there suddenly appeared a woman's arm out of the water and it was clad in white and it was adorned with many bracelets and the hand of the arm catched the sheath of excalibur and drew it underneath the water and no one ever beheld that sheath again so the sheath of excalibur was lost and that was a grievous thing for king arthur in after time as you may sometime read now after queen morgana le fay had thus thrown the sheath of excalibur into the lake she went on a little further to where there was a very lonely place with a great many rocks and stones lying about upon the ground and when she had come to that place she exercised very potent spells of magic that merlin had taught her so by means of those spells she transformed herself and all of her court and all of their horses into large round stones of diverse sizes then in a little while came king arthur to that place with his knights and esquires and he was exceedingly heavy of heart for he had beheld from a great distance how queen morgana le fay had thrown the sheath of excalibur into that lake now when the king and his court had come to that spot the damsel vivian called out upon him to stop and she said to him lord dost thou behold all those great round stones yea said the king i do see them then vivian said lo those stones are queen morgana le fay and the court who were with her for this magic that she hath done to change herself and them into stones was a certain thing that merlin had taught her now i myself know that magic and i also know how to remove that magic at my will wherefore if thou wilt promise to immediately punish that wicked woman for all her treason by depriving her of her life then i will bring her back unto her true shape again so that thou mayest have her in thy power then king arthur looked upon vivian with great displeasure and he said damsel thou hast a cruel heart thou thyself hast suffered no injury at the hands of queen morgana wherefore then wouldst thou have me slay her now but for all thou hast done for me i would be very much affronted with thee as for her i forgive her all of this and i shall forgive her again and again and yet again if she sin against me for her mother was my mother and the blood which flows in her veins and in my veins cometh from the same fountain head wherefore i will do no evil thing against her let us return again whence we came then vivian looked upon king arthur very bitterly and she laughed with great scorn and said thou art both a fool and a dotard and therewith she vanished from the sight of all 
and after that because king arthur had rebuked her for her wickedness in the presence of others she hated him even more than morgana le fay had hated him some time after that king arthur heard how merlin had been beguiled by vivian and he sorrowed with great bitterness that merlin was lost unto the world in that wise so endeth the story of the passing of merlin end of section twenty six recording by dominic trace